okay, so I wasn't there doing my due diligence, what I should be doing. It's just crazy. You know, it seems like every year they create more and more laws to make sure that there are reasons to lock people up. People who are not doing anything when you talk about victimless crimes. And I just think that it, it is, it, it behooves us to really start thinking about um, the things that our state government and our legislature uh, do in our name. And this is why I advocate more than anything when I'm dealing with these offenders. The first thing that I say to them when they come home is, are you registered to vote? I think that, you know, and it's just my personal opinion that no ex-offender should be allowed back into the community unless it's mandatory that they're registered to vote because if you want to get back into this game, then you have to be able to vote. I don't care who you vote for. I just want to make sure that you have that right and that you understand what that right means because too often we are allowing uh, the people who, quote unquote, uh, have been there too long to continue to, to do the things that need to change. Uh, and, and I think that this is why we're seeing this, this circus of uh, a political um, uh, farce, that's what I call it. Um, and the less, choosing the lesser of two evils when we're dealing with Trump, when we're dealing with Hillary Clinton. I mean, you know, uh, it's just it's scary and where we're going right now. And so I just hope that uh, we can do better than this. So, um, freedom hat off for a second. Sorry, sorry, I'll move it away. I'm gonna take my freedom works hat off for a second. Is everybody cool with that? This is just a supply of the guy talking. Um, because this is actually a really tricky subject for me. Everything you say can and will be used against you. <laughs> Are you you're gonna use this against me? I'm just kidding, you're the prosecutor. Okay. No, so, like, I'm, I'm a rarity. I'm a libertarian who's actually never smoked pot. Um, I'm, a, I'm a unicorn, apparently. <laughs> yes. So um, one thing I want to say, like I don't, um, people who commit victimless crimes personally, I mean, one I think it should be a state issue. There is no reasonable justification for the federal government to be involved in the regulation of uh, of drugs. I think a state should handle it. As you mentioned before, states handle the vast majority of of criminal cases. We have two hundred, roughly two hundred thousand people in federal uh, in the federal prison population. We have 2.2 million people in total incarcerated across the United States. It's predominantly handled on the local level. Uh, states should be handling this. Now, to put my Freedom Works hat back on, um, one thing you were talking about, it, I, I want to, you mentioned Clinton before in the 94 crime bill. Uh, it's a completely legitimate criticism. Um, I look at the 86 crime bill and the 94 crime bill. Um, the interesting thing, and I, I said this recently, it was a progressive radio host, I think in Cleveland, and I was talking, he blamed Republicans for the vast majority of the tough on crime laws. And I was like, wait, 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 hold on a second, hold on a second. Let's, like, the Congressional Black Caucus supported the 1986 crime bill. The Congressional Black Caucus largely, if not exclude, uh, unanimously, voted for the 94 crime bill. Um, this has been a bipartisan problem. It's a biracial problem. Everybody's got, everybody's guilty here in terms of, creating this, this this issue, this problem. Um, and so just just want to add that. Oh, to, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and then the, the final thing, talking about heroin. So recently, Kelly Ayotte, the senator from New Hampshire, she's vulnerable and there's a heroin, heroin epidemic in New Hampshire. It was well documented during the Republican primary there. Um, she tried to uh, attack on an amendment to the National Defense Authorization Act. What that has to do with drugs, I don't um, but she tried to tack on an amendment to the NDAA that would uh, criminalize 0.5 grams. This is possession. This is possession. This is not drug trafficking. This is possession. 0.5 grams, less than a gram, of any drug containing trace amounts of fentanyl. Now, fentanyl is a powerful opiate. It's the one that killed Prince, um, and they typically use it in, for, for surgical. Uh, it's more. It's like 50 or 40 or 50 times more powerful than uh, than uh, morphine. Uh, but the problem is with, with Ayotte's amendment wasn't the fact that she was going after fentanyl, it's the fact that fentanyl is not added to heroin in the United States. It's added, it gets imported from South America, it goes through Mexico, it gets added predominantly in Mexico, even the DEA has said this. It gets added in Mexico and then it makes its way into the United States. Very rarely do you find instances in which uh, fentanyl is added to heroin inside the United States. So we're basically, we would have locked people up for 
five years for containing less than a gram of, of any drug containing fentanyl. It's ridiculous. That's a, that's a drug treatment problem. That's an addiction problem. That's not a drug trafficking problem. People are, uh, I just want to note, like, I, the victimless crime thing of as it relates to heroin and crack cocaine, things like that, I think treatment programs work better if you're going to keep it criminalized. If you're not going to keep it criminalized, let's say it's decide whether, it's, whether the criminality of any sort of drug, recreational or not, exists. Uh, personally, I, mean, I think the one person who's probably come around with this the most is Ted Cruz. Boo him if you want, because it was our instant speech, if not great. Um, but Ted Cruz has come around with this saying that like, at least marijuana states should be able to regulate. So um, that's kind of where personally I am. Let's get some questions from the audience. Anybody have a question? Just raise your hand. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, first off, to the gentleman that was incarcerated, I'm sorry, I don't know your name. Richard. I understand from your standpoint that you see it as when white people find out, they all of a sudden get stabbed. But I, I, I promise you this, I'm here tonight because I'm just finding out. I, I didn't know. That's not everybody, but I'm just, you know, I understand where you're coming from, and I'm not saying that you're wrong. And I'm just telling you. I just found out it's just becoming apparent to me, and that's why I'm, I'm here to see you. And, and you know, glad that you're here. Um, and and you know, don't don't take it as an attack. No, I'm not. Because it, it's not. It's these are it's just the facts. It's a discussion. Uh, right. And, and and you know, um, me and my wife friends sit down and we talk all the time, <laughs> all the time. <laughs> We, we uh, you know, and, and we go back and forth, we go back and forth, and because the bottom line is at the end of the day, we understand that most of the things that happen um, are based upon the, uh, the fact that we're allowing things to happen, you know, um, and, and voting is a big deal, it is a big deal, um, it's one of the biggest deals, and, and because if you were not, most of the people are concerned about um, the national level, but it's the local level where it really, really counts in your home state, right here. You know, um, if you don't, if you allow certain individuals or certain entities to get into office, then things are not going to change. It's just going to be the Girl Boy Network all over again. Okay, and until you, uh, until we address that, uh, which is what my organization is trying to do. Uh, uh, part of my organization um, is to uh, unite ex-offenders as they come home and to create a voting base that will change the political climate of the city of Indianapolis as well as everywhere else. Um, because we don't have a voice. When you're talking um, uh, what the uh, LGBT community did, you know, I'm taking a page out of their book and looking at what's possible, okay? And for me, um, if I can get 200,000 people to say, no, we're not gonna do that, it makes a difference, and people will start listening. And then, and but but at the same time, when you get people to listen, you have to have a plan, and so therefore you've got to have something put in place already. Um, and these are the th these are my growing pains. These are the things that I'm learning, um, having spent um, 26 years in prison. Um, it's difficult for me to now navigate the technology. Um, you know, there are so many things. You know, people talk about. Um, uh, the, the programs and things that they have out here. Um, uh, I sit on the, uh, the board of, of seven different places. Um, I work with the uh, Marion County Reentry Coalition, the MCRC as well. Um, unfortunately, there is so much funding that's being tossed around that never reaches the clients. Okay, you know, you have a client that will come in looking for aid and assistance and the first thing that's shoved at them is an application. When that application is filled out, um, we'll get back to you. Okay. Now we have the piece of paper that says we've served someone, and so this is where this is how we get our grant. So now, whether we serve you or not, it doesn't matter because we get our grant. Okay. This is what's happening with the boots on the ground. And we can have conversation about all of this other stuff, but people that need real help out here that are really, really struggling, it's a problem. You know, and, and you know, a lot of people don't like my opinions because usually I don't fiddle faddle around with them. I just simply say what it is, because this is just what it is. And you know, you can give me a thousand reasons why you can call it something else, but at the end of the day, 
people are struggling. Let's, let's go ahead and take another question. We've got about 10 minutes left. Hang, hang on just a second. I want to try and get as many people as possible. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, Richard, how many, what percentage of the inmates that you were incarcerated in the you say had diagnosable mental illnesses? I would probably say, oh, wow. Um, that's a great question. I'm going to say about 35%. Uh, and that's a low that's a low number um, because you have to understand. And, and here we are back to like it is. They closed down Central State Hospital. They just now closed down the Rue Carter. Where do you think they're going? They're going to prison, okay? Or jail, exactly. And the thing is, is that every and, and you have to understand. And, and my 26 years was not just straight in the road. It's in and out, in and out, in and out. And so. The 70s. The 70s. Okay, I was in prison in the 80s. But for the last five decades, it seems like I've always been like that. I'm sorry, man. But <laughs> it just seems like I was always gone. Um, but every every time I saw a change, because they went from one bunk levels, then they stacked them. Then they stacked them again. And now you have so many levels because you have to understand when you're getting $31,000 per person. Per person, I'm trying to lock up as, and, and honestly, as a business person, I'm trying to lock up as many people as I possibly can. And it's even worse in the private prison system where prisoners can be eight to ninety thousand dollars. Prisoners, prisoners are treated as commodities. And, and we are simply commodities to be traded. And then you have to understand you're not even thinking about the fact that when you are released, you are still acting as treated as a commodity because now you're sending me to anger management. Now you're sending me to probation. Now you're sending me to, to do a dirty drop to do drops. A drug test and a simple technical violation. And I don't even have to have have a drug offense to be drug tested every single day. And it costs me thirteen dollars every time I go. When I'm released from prison, I don't have any money. Okay, and so what do you think that I'm going to end up doing? To get money. Exactly. To pay money. You know, I, I come. I, I'm just fortunate enough, uh, personally, that um, I had someone who was an anchor for me to be there, and so my life chain turned out a little bit better. But I look at all the guys that I left behind and the guys that I see on a daily basis that don't have the support system that I have, and those individuals are left floundering. Another question? Yeah, go ahead. So what kind of recidivism programs do you guys think work and what kind are out there? Just to what like else there have a yeah, So Texas has one. It's uh, they, they actually bring in a private company, or I think it's a nonprofit, to come in and actually teach the prisoners business skills. Uh, they give them basically a college, uh, what the equivalent of a college degree, they go out and they start their own business. The recidivism rate for this program in Texas, and I wrote about it, it's at freedomworks.org, I'm sorry, I don't remember the name of the program, but the recidivism rate for that program is 7%. That is re-arrest within three years, only 7% of people are, are re-arrested within three years. That's phenomenal. But we, job training, work training, uh, education, those are the types of things that we want to see, the types of programs we want to see. Uh, but it doesn't, it's not just recidivism reducing programming in prisons that matter, it's re-entry programs. Uh, record sealing and expungement, Texas and Georgia have done phenomenal work on record sealing and expungement, especially as it relates to nonviolent offenders. Uh, and then some states are pursuing ban the box. Uh, it relates to uh, government jobs or administrative jobs inside, inside the public sector. Uh, I don't personally like it as a libertarian, I don't think the government should mandate that to private businesses. Uh, and then there's also a piece of legislation working in its way through uh, Pennsylvania right now called Clean Slate. If someone keeps their uh, their record clean for 10 years, their slate will be wiped, wiped clean. The only people who will be able to see it is police officers when the person is uh, pulled over. But no uh, job uh, or any or education or, or uh, housing uh, that the person pursues, the, the administrators for those types of things would not see their criminal record, which is a definite positive in terms of reducing recidivism. And just right quick, and I just want to talk about the word reentry. Okay, this is a word that uh, everyone is throwing around. Um, and this is what this word is what gets a lot of money funding funneling into um, Indianapolis and a lot of the other states. When you talk about reentry, that means that you're coming back into society. To me, the word reentry is a misnomer. Okay, because in order for me to come back into society, that means that I had to already be there once before. If I'm a criminal on the streets, I'm not part of society. I'm not doing, I'm not abiding by the laws. So how can I re-enter into anywhere? Okay, I've got to first be taught, we're talking about like 
Like when you go to the military, what do you get? Basic training. When you go to a job, what do you get? Orientation. So therefore, you know, before I can re-enter anywhere, before I can come back to somewhere, I have to have been part of that process. If I am a criminal, I am not part of that process. And so basically, I have to be taught what it is to be a regular citizen first before I can re-enter anywhere. One last question. Uh, go ahead. Uh, how big is the problem of employers uh, pulling extortion on uh, people re-entering through their jobs? Let's, let's go ahead and take one more. Yeah, in the back. Yeah, so on the whole inconsistency issue, going back to that, I want to you know, recognize that uh, Brent and his colleagues have way too much of a workload uh, put upon them, as well as the fact that uh, it's, it's the Indiana General Assembly that writes all the laws. What, what solution I've thought of, I'm curious in your thoughts, what if we did away with uh, plea bargaining? You guys just prosecute the case, the public defenders defend against it. If you get convicted, you get there's a set amount of time you go away for, and instead we just have a conversation of, do we really need to send people away for that long for that, that crime? Better get ready to build some more ports. Well, that's what I mean. mean like, oh, okay, yeah. Here, here's reality. Yeah. Is in my jurisdiction, we're going to file about between, I would say, 2,500 criminal cause numbers a year. About those 2,500 criminal cause numbers a year, approximately, say, no more than roughly 2,000, give or take, are going to be misdemeanors and low-level low level, like level six felonies. That leaves, say, three, four, five hundred of other types of crimes. Okay? We got three fours. Okay? This is the same caseload roughly within a relatively small percentage that's been in place. It's been at the same rate for about the last 10 years. It's not increased. It's not dramatically decreased. That's about roughly where we are. And so, we're going to try and have trials. Um, and we're going to have 10. We're going to have 15. We're not after 2,500. Okay. And really, that's kind of down a little bit from where it's been before because we're not generating as much stuff like the traffic stops. There's a variety of reasons why there's not as much traffic generated crime as what there had been before. Frankly, a lot of that is people are not drinking alcohol as much as what they used to. And so you're not getting those cherry picked DUIs like you used to have. Now those cases take a lot more effort and a lot more work and there's not as many of them as there used to be 10 years ago. That's what we encounter in our jurisdiction. Um, you're going to burn through a whole lot of jurors. And you know, you've got to have a judge sit on the bench and he's got to call balls and strikes and make rulings when you're having trials. And beyond that, you know, so logistically, that's just not possible. Um, beyond that, you know, every every statute and every situation is slightly different. If somebody gets a, a DUI and they're .08, okay, does that guy deserve the same penalty theoretically? If somebody's going 120 miles an hour and they blow a 1.4 or a 1.6 or they're 2.4, no. Right. Well, I mean, that's why I'm asking. Instead of you and the public, or you and the defender having that conversation, maybe we should have that conversation as a society at the uh, at the state. Well, there's, there's so many different. Every single incident is going to be different for a variety of reasons. There's so many different variables that are in play. It can be part of the history. It can be the specific facts of the crime. It can be that maybe somebody's going to be in a position to have a more favorable outcome because their attorney was able to suppress certain evidence and the judge found the evidence was collected illegally. And that, you know, was a fatal problem in the state's case. And so that person may get a misdemeanor instead of a felony, right? I mean, there's 101 variables that are out there. And that's just the nature of the system that we have. Um, you know, it involves people. And anytime you involve, you know, people and human actors, you're going to have some people they're going to make good decisions, and unfortunately, you know, you're going to ask them to leave the wrong. Um, I, I don't think you want to take away all of the human element of things because if you go, if you do, if you do that, you're going to end up with a different series of problems for people that are going to have other sentences which are out and not congruent with what they should have. Want to come with this, and uh, again, maybe some of our guests will stay around for a little bit if they can. Uh, anything you guys want to promote or talk about here as we as we wrap up today? <laughs> here for work, work paid for me to come here. So uh, if you guys want to check out what we're doing on criminal justice, please go to freedomworks.org slash justice for all. A couple of white papers I've written, one is called uh, Federalism in Action, How States Got Smart on Crime. 
uh, it talks about Texas and Georgia and uh, mentions some of the other states that have worked on criminal justice. One of the topics we didn't discuss tonight because it's uh, kind of, it's related in some respects to civil asset forfeiture. Uh, Freedom versus staunchly opposed to civil asset forfeiture and we have a white paper on that called From High Seas to Highway Robbery. Uh, I would encourage you guys to read it. We also have one called The Overcriminalization uh, over Epidemic, which is about criminal intent and mens rea, uh, which is a, a, a law of held legal principle. So please go to freedomworks.org and check that stuff out. I have business cards in the back if anybody wants to email me, and I'll be here until Brett leaves, because he's my guy. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, as I said, my name is Richard Samuels, and my organization is Growing Indy. Uh, I can be reached at area code three one seven nine nine two eight two three six. I also have a radio show, which is called uh, the Growing Indie Reentry Radio Show. We talk about um, the new laws and, and, and all of the things, the resource providers that are out there, and try to make sure that um, the returning citizens, which is the new watchword, uh, not ex offenders, um, that uh, the returning citizens have options, and, and uh, there are definitely. Uh, certain resource providers we direct them to and others we say steer clear of those because those are just uh, basically trying to make sure that they are able to uh, uh, renew their grants. So, Where can we see you Saturday? <laughs> right. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Uh, on Saturday, uh, July the 30th, um, uh, our organization is partnering with another organization called Peacekeepers in Indianapolis. Um, Bishop Horatio Lester is uh, the uh, CEO and founder of that, uh, and uh, we are going to have a gathering of, of mothers and families who have lost loved ones uh, to violence in the community. Um, uh, what I talk about the most is that um, we talk about a lot of the police action shootings and white cops and, and black victims, and, and, and what I'm promoting here on uh, uh, Saturday is that uh, in order for us to um, Really talk about anything. We have to talk about the, the black on black crime first, um, because I think that you know before you can um, uh, tell someone else that they're doing something wrong, you have to be treating yourself better. You know, so that's kind of part of my focus on Saturday is to talk about the fact that we have to get our community uh, to the place where we're not killing each other before we can complain about somebody else killing us. So where and when? Uh, <laughs> uh, I promise uh, I'm not making any money off this. I absolutely, he's really not. Um, we will be at uh, School 69. Uh, it's at actually the corner of 34th and Keystone. I'm hoping and praying that it doesn't rain. We're looking to get about at least 1,000 to 2,000 people out there. I mean, we, we uh, really have plugged this thing a lot. Not, trust me, don't look at my example of plugging it because I'm not doing a great job of it. But um, it's uh, 3421 North Keystone Avenue, and it'll be from 3 o'clock to 7 o'clock in the evening. And so we're hoping that anyone who'd like to comes out, and um, you know, it, it's going to be an interesting, it's called Locked Arms. And uh, definitely we're not going to you know, be saying kumbaya, we're going to be talking about some issues. Um, thank you for your time, thank you for your patience and listening to things tonight. One thing I did want to make sure that I mentioned is that there's the police, when they go home, a lot of them go home to the neighborhoods in the community. When the prosecutors go home, they go to homes in the community. And they want a good, safe community, probably just as much as you do, and just as Absolutely. much as you do. And there's a lot of room for agreement on a lot of these issues. And I think there's a lot of room for there to be consensus, for there to be a lot of cooperation. Um, and ultimately, in court, when I'm in front of a jury or when I'm dealing with people in public, tone matters. The way that you communicate with people matters. And we can communicate in such a way that we can build bridges or walls in everything we do. And I think this is an important enough issue where we all be well served to try to build try to build some bridges so that we can do good things for the country that we all have. Well said. Well said. Well said. <laughs> Shake your heads, yes. Um, my, name is, stop it, um, my name is Chloe Nagnos. I am a new board member for America's Future Foundation. Um, and I definitely wanted to go ahead and give um, Brent a special round of applause for filling in um, to help us fill out our panel. So if you could go ahead and do that.
Advocates for Self-Government donated a signed copy of How to Be a Super Communicator for Liberty by Sharon Harris. Um, if you found value in tonight's event, um, we'll go ahead and start bidding so that we're able to put on free events like this um, for folks that appreciate it and get something from it. So cover price is $20. If anyone is interested in bidding, I'll start at $20. My best twenty dollars. Pile in the back. Do I have twenty-five? Twenty-five. I have twenty-five. Do I have thirty? Thirty behind. Uh, thirty behind me. Do I have thirty-five? Okay, I've got thirty-five. Do I have forty? Do I hear forty? Kyle's doing forty. Okay, do I hear forty-five? Forty-five. Forty going once. Forty going twice. Forty to Pedro in the back. <laughs> Aaron, I have a second sign of <laughs> How to be a super communicator for liberty. If you would like it for 40 as well, I'll sell it to you for 40. All right. Thank you very much.